All right. Welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. Uh, this week is the Autonomy Talk number 50. So we reached the first uh, milestone and we are very happy to have Carlos Ferrazza, who is a PhD candidate at the Institute for Dynamic Systems and Control at ETH Zurich, uh, working with Professor uh, Raffaello D'Andrea. So something about Carlo, uh, before starting his PhD, he obtained uh, two bachelor degrees, one in automation engineering for Polytechnic of Milano, and one in electronics and information engineering from Tongji University in China. He then moved to Zurich to obtain his uh, master's degree in robotic systems and control from ETH Zurich. Um, his main research interests include the design and development of vision-based data-driven tactile sensors and the applications of such sensors to robot control and exterior manipulation. Uh, interestingly, he has been able to uh, communicate his research to the general public through two uh, main, uh, uh, let's say, venues, which are the World Minds in 2019 and the um, TEDx Zurich in 2020. Then this is this is very very cool. Um, and also, he was recipient of some uh, some best paper awards and thesis awards for his work. So uh, it's uh, in, in this uh, growing field is uh, is has obtained. Uh, large number of uh, achievements. Today is gonna talk about data-driven vision-based tactile sensing and some of the recent advances in this field. And we're very happy to hear what he's gonna talk about. So Carlo, go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I believe that um, robots need an actual sense of touch to address most of the interaction tasks that they're going to face that involve physical contact. And this would enable a number of applications from warehousing to entertainment, from human robot interaction to medical devices. In this context, in the last five to 10 years, we've seen an incredible growth in the development of high resolution tactile sensors for robotics applications. And these tactile sensors can be based on a variety of different principles, for example, resistive, capacitive, vision-based tactile sensors, and so on. Now, these sensors can therefore present a different raw tactile data, which, depending on the principle, can be electric current, capacitance, pixels and densities, and so on. So for this reason, I believe that now more than ever, we need to extract intermediate representations from the raw tactile data, such that techniques and results could be reused and reproduced even when not the same tactile sensors are being employed. And this will be one of the main messages of my presentation, as I will detail later in the talk. Now let's take a step back and with a short introduction, see what we generally mean with sense of touch and try to understand the importance of this sensory feedback in humans to possibly extract some requirements for robots. You may already see in this video where a woman has had her fingers anesthetized and therefore she can only use her sense of vision, her sight, to perform a simple task as striking a match. And she's having a very hard time just because she misses that valuable information normally provided by the sense of touch. If we instead look at robots, the very traditional way of getting touch or contact feedback were four torque sensors. However, these sensors are pretty bulky and they're stiff, so generally they're only used in the robot wrist. Therefore, when interacting with the environment, they only provide information about the forces acting at a single point, at the center of the sensor usually. In contrast, I'm going to show you two examples of how the human sense of touch is much more capable than this, which has motivated the increasing development of modern tactile sensors. First, we have soft and dexterous hands, which provides us with stable gripping when we handle an object, exploiting, for example, the high compliance and the friction of our skin. Additionally, our receptors can very well uh, detect and distinguish between shear and pressure forces, even when they are simultaneously applied over the skin. Finally, our receptors are not limited to specific regions of our body, for example, our hands, but they are distributed all over our body. And this in particular allows us to perform difficult tasks as when we don't only use the hands, but also our legs or the chest to lift a heavy box. So we have these sensors, our receptors, that are placed all over the skin, which means over different types of surfaces, which can be either curved or flat. So using these capabilities as an inspiration, I'm going to describe the vision-based tactile sensing principle, which especially tackles the requirements of high-resolution scalability. 
The sensing principle uh, that we developed is based on the tracking of particles within a deformable surface. For this, we use a camera, which we place inside this aluminum part, and we surround it with LEDs for constant illumination. On top of the camera, we place three layers of silicon. Our first layer is transparent, it's quite stiff, and just serves as a base for the remaining two layers. This layer here that you can see in green just is, is also transparent, but embeds thousands of green fluorescent particles that act as markers for our technique. Then we have a black layer that just covers the uh, sensors and shields it from the external disturbances. Here you can see the sensor in action and upon the formation, the particles start to move and create different patterns that are captured by the camera. The randomness of the particle distribution facilitates manufacture and their denseness makes it possible to extract information at each pixel of the camera image. The technique I described does not assume the surface to be necessarily flat, as in the case of the sensor that I've just showed. In fact, we have also built sensors with slightly curved surfaces, for example, to resemble fingertips, or sensors using multiple embedded cameras, as in the one on the right, where we used four Raspberry Pi cameras to achieve at the same time a reduced thickness and a larger surface. All these sensors were fabricated in the same way without any special adaptation and rely on the exact sensing principle, proving the easiness and scalability of the approach that we proposed. So the sensing principle provides raw tactile data in the form of pixel intensities. But how can we further process the pixel information to extract an intermediate representation that can act as a powerful abstraction to plan generic robotic tasks? When looking at most of the tasks, we are generally interested in total forces, both shear and pressure forces, and contact patches, which are the surface regions in contact with an object that provide, for example, information about the shape of the contact object. And we want to estimate these quantities for arbitrary contact conditions, so possibly for multiple points of contact and for interactions with objects of different shape. If we manage to do all of this in real time, we would then have a very powerful sensor, which would provide truly rich information ready to use for generic tasks. So with these requirements in mind, we decided to move towards the estimation of a very comprehensive quantity, which is the three-dimensional contact force distribution. And in fact, from the force distribution, one could compute the total contact forces by simply integrating the distribution over the sensing surface. And one could retrieve the contact patches by detecting the regions where the distribution is also greater than zero. And this representation remains valid for the different possible contact conditions, so multi-contact, arbitrary shapes, and so on. However, since we want to estimate a finite dimensional quantity, we need an additional step. And for this reason, we discretize the sensing surface over a finite number of bins and compute the force distribution as a set of the three-dimensional vectors indicating the force acting at each of these beams. This means that if we make contact with a test object that has multiple points of contact, two in this case, we get this image that is to some extent interpretable by to a human observer. I don't know if you can spot here the sparse regions of markets. But we want to further process it and extract a three-dimensional force field out of it, as you can see here at the bottom. And here we used 400 bins, so where the side of each bin was about 1.6 millimeters. We want to be able to sense contact locations, but also the force profile. Here, for, for, for example, you can see a higher force in this point, since the finger-shaped body here on the top is actually going deeper than this other one into the material. So summarizing our task, we have tactile images as inputs and discretized force distributions as outputs. And we try to reconstruct these outputs, the force distribution, from the images observed at each time step. We do this in a data-driven fashion, since such an approach can theoretically exhibit arbitrary accuracy, depending on the data provided. Essentially, compared to model-based methods, so we don't have to compromise accuracy by making model simplifications to retain real-time tractability, but we just need to provide very accurate data. Additionally, data-driven approaches generally show very fast inference times, especially if we make use of tailored learning architecture. 
Of course, we need to collect training data, and I'm going to show you how we can do this in the next slides. So for a simple case, consider a point indentation, which is an indentation with a very sharp contact object, for example, a needle. And assuming that as a result of a purely vertical indentation, we only record a vertical force. Now, if we can measure this uh, force, for example, with one of the uh, force sensors that I showed you earlier, like the stiff force sensors, then we could record such a ground truth force F and assign it to the beam that contains the point of contact and assign zero force to all the remaining beams. In this scenario, we can even automate the data collection. For example, if we attach this needle indenter to the spindle of an automatic milling machine, we could then perform thousands of indentations with such an indenter. And if we also record in the meanwhile the tactile images and the force, the ground truth force, for example, with a force sensor, it can also be attached to the milling machine. We would then have finally a fully experimental data set made of images as features and force values as outputs or labels. However, in a general case, we have indentations that span multiple beams and not only one, because we have indenters of arbitrary shapes and that can uh, induce uh, forces that are three-dimensional, not only vertical, so comprising both pressure and shear forces. The issue is that we have no available sensors that estimate the force distribution, the three-dimensional force distribution, without altering the contact with the soft material. To overcome this issue, we perform in simulation the same indentations that I showed before with the automatic milling machine. But this time we do it in a finite element environment. And for this, we represent our sensor with very accurate hyperelastic hyper -elastic models, which we obtained by state-of-the-art material characterization experiment, of which you can see an example in this video. For each indentation in the finite element simulations, we then extract the three-dimensional force distribution, which is represented as a set of 3D vectors for each node of a fine mesh. You can see the nodes in green here. We obtain a discretized ground truth force distribution by summing the nodal forces inside the regular bins shown here in red. And since this is actually the best we can get, we can assign such a ground truth label to the corresponding images that we can capture on real world experiments, for example, with an automatic machine. Of course, we anyway verified the accuracy of the labels on what we can actually measure with commodity sensors, and that is the total force. So essentially, we compared the total force obtained from the FEM with total forces measured by a force torque sensor in the same experiment. So we first tuned our friction coefficient with a single shear experiment made with a spherical 3D printed body on which you can see the good agreement between the FEM and the real world readings. What we did here is to apply pressure with the contact body and then translate it horizontally and measure the horizontal force at discrete steps that you can see here. And even if we tuned on a single experiment, the model generalizes well also to other materials. See, for example, here, the contact with a stainless steel indenter, which is much smoother than the 3D printed one. And the reason for this good agreement is that our sensing surface is quite sticky and this dominates usually in the contact friction pair. Obviously, there is a performance degradation for materials that do not correspond to the one that we use for tuning, uh, the friction coefficient, but we still obtain an accuracy of around the 10% on the maximum force. Now, the model generalizes well also to other indenters. And you can see, for example, here a shear experiment with a square flat object. And here you can see a pure vertical indentation with a multi contact body that resembles the two fingers, uh, two, two fingers uh, pressing on the surface. And again, we obtained a very good agreement also on the vertical force. Therefore, the labels seem to capture the right trends. And summarizing, we could create a data set where the features could be images collected in real world experiments. And the labels are ground truth force distributions obtained by finite element simulations. Now, here we have several issues. The first one being the fact that we want to pair data that comes from two different domains, the simulation and the real world. And this means that we have to make sure that the uh, reference frame of the milling machine, of the automatic machine, is uh, perfectly aligned with the reference frame of the gel that we also use in our simulation environment. And this is very difficult to do, especially when there are soft materials involved. Also, we still need to collect real-world data for our features, for our images. 
And this data is to be collected for each sensor that we fabricate because it clearly depends on the distribution of the markets and so on. This creates some sensor dependence that we also wanted to eliminate together with the fact that we wanted to get rid of this time consuming data collection in the real world. So we asked ourselves, can we do everything in simulation? For this, we need to simulate the tactile images as well. And we can do this by first sampling the, uh, the displacement field that we can also obtain via the FEM simulations. And the sampling location will kind of, repre will kind of represent the fictitious locations of our particles in the simulation world. We then have to account for the fact that the displacement field we obtain from the FEM is given in a frame which is not centered with the camera. Therefore, we need a transformation from the gel frame to the camera frame. And this we do as usual uh, with, uh, via a rotation matrix and a translation vector. It allows us to uh, transform the, um, the, the, the location of a fictitious particle and the relative displacement from the gel frame to the camera frame. Then we assume an ideal pinhole camera projection, which is a very strong assumption, but it allows us to perform a closed form projection of the spherical particles that become ellipses onto the image plane. So in here, you can see the results of our simulations. And you can see here on the right simulated synthetic images, depending on different, that are generated according to different contact conditions that we kind of replicate in simulation. And if we, um, if we generate hundreds of thousands of these images through uh, various um, contact conditions in the simulated world, we can create a synthetic data set, which we represent as a two-channel tensor, which means uh, that for each sample, we have two channels, one, the first one uh, representing the image before the formation, which we also randomize, as you can see, different markers distribution for each samples, and the second channel containing the image after the formation. As you can see here, you, maybe you can spot some sparser regions of the markers where there was some contact. So summarizing, we finally have both features and labels from simulation, where features are uh, tactile images, raw tactile images that we obtain in simulation from finite element simulations. And uh, the labels are also ground through force distribution obtained in simulation through the same finite element experiment. But since these data are valid in the simulation domain, how can we make sure that whatever mapping we learn from this data also works in reality? For this, we need an additional step, which is camera calibration. Essentially, we need to take some pictures of a predefined pattern to extract the camera model. And since we use our camera through a silicon medium, we need to do the, to do the calibration also uh, through silicon. And for this reason, we place some silicon shapes between the predefined pattern and the camera to take six pictures of uh, the pattern that then we use with a state-of-the-art calibration technique that allows us to obtain both the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters of the camera. Finally, we use the model we obtained from calibration to remap the images taken in the real world as if they were shot from the ideal camera that we used in simulation. And this is a crucial part because we can redirect an instance of the sensors that we fabricate to the same pinhole camera model. And this has a lot of benefits to collecting data in the pinhole camera frame. This is how the remapping works. For each pixel in the ideal pinhole camera, we can find the corresponding 3D point um, in the real world uh, where we assume a fixed vertical coordinate for all the particles. And then we can reproject back to the real world camera image uh, through the calibration matrices uh, to, uh, to find the corresponding pixel. In detail, we first perform a 2D transformation from this pixel P to a point S in the 3D world. And then we project this point S back to the um, camera image in the real world for, to find the pixel Q that then corresponds to the original pixel P in the pinhole camera frame. We do this last step here with uh, functionality that is also provided by uh, the calibration toolbox that we employ. Looking at the result of the remapping, you can see here on the right a remapped image where the misalignments and distortion of the camera have been eliminated. And finally, our image 
uh, our particles occupy a square surface, which is actually the actual shape of the sensing surface in the real world. And comparing such an image with a synthetic image, you can see that, of course, there are a model defects that we haven't accounted for, but uh, we are kind of going into the right direction. So summarizing, we now have tactile images as inputs and ground truth force distributions as outputs, both obtained via finite element simulations that we can use to train a data-driven approach. To evaluate such an approach, what we do in the real-world sensor is to just collect some images during contact, perform the remapping, and predict the current force distribution. So using only the simulation data, we train a tailored neural network architecture based on the slimmer version of UNET, a very powerful architecture often used in image segmentation. The network is based on a contracting path where relevant features are extracted from the images and the decoding step where the force distribution is computed through up convolutions and concatenations of the high resolution features extracted during the contraction step. As a result, the architecture has the effect of both capturing the intensity of the forces and enabling precise contact localization. The training data consisted of simulated indentations with several indenters, and in order to increase the robustness of the training, we perturb the images by altering their brightness and using some sort of pepper noise during training. After training, we then evaluated the network on a series of indentations that we collected in the real world experiments with several contact objects. The network retains high accuracy on real world data on all the components of the 3D contact force distribution. The inference of the force distribution runs at 120 Hertz on the CPU of a standard laptop with the limiting frequency being the maximum frame rate of the camera, 120 frames per second. Let me stress again that an additional benefit of the simulation training is especially that we do not need to retrain our network for each real world sensor, but we only need to extract the camera calibration parameters for each sensor instance that we fabricate. More illustrative results, if you look at a specific sample, on the first row, you can see the ground truth resulting from a shear indentation in the y direction following pressure. And the real world prediction matches this quite well. You can see the asymmetry here in the y direction, indicating shear in, it, in this direction, and asymmetric structure instead retained in x, as well as the contact patch in the pressure distribution. While this was the comparison with the FEM ground truth, if we look at how the predictions compare with a force torque sensor in terms of the total force, you can see also a good agreement over time where the solid lines here are the force torque measurements and uh, the dashed lines are the predictions. Again, you can obtain total force from our predictions by summing the respective component of the force distribution over the old surface. Here we have a, a shear indentation with a cylindrical indenter. While here we have a, pressure, a vertical indentation with a triangular flat indenter. Now the largest imperfections that you can see here, for example, um, are mainly due to the very large deformations that are introduced by the flat triangular indenter, which however do not hinder us from capturing the actual thing. Finally, even if we only train the neural network on data consisting of a set of specific contacts, the convolutional structure of the network shows generalization capabilities when applied also to generic objects, as well as in the contact with multiple bodies, a case which was not present at training. Drawing an outlook on this work, let me point out that the current simulation is static, so we neglect the dynamic effects, for example, hysteresis, that could be relevant for uh, some applications. And in addition, we only consider the fixed friction coefficient that turned out to work well also for different materials, as I showed you earlier. But if a, a more precise, more accurate identification of the uh, friction coefficient was to be required, this could be done with procedures that need to account for uh, the behavior of the sensor over time, for example, using multiple images. Finally, here we focused on building a very accurate domain, uh, a very accurate um, simulation such that we could get a seamless transfer from simulation to reality. However, domain adaptation techniques uh, could uh, directly address, explicitly address such gaps uh, and will be also subject of our future work. 
Now, the next thing we asked ourselves is how can we use this powerful physical representation as the force distribution that we can now estimate with our sensor to achieve dynamic tactile control tasks? We wanted then to design a test, but that was at the same time low dimensional, but representative of the problems encountered when dealing with contact in a generic manipulation scenario. We also wanted our system to be capable of highly dynamic motions uh, to trigger complex behavior that are often neglected when dealing with manipulation in a slower setting. Therefore, we built a system that resemble a classical inverted pendulum, but without a mechanically fixed pivot point. This means that we can just grab a pole, an unknown, a pole with unknown physical characteristics and swing it up to the vertical position without having the pole uh, physically attached to, uh, to the fingers and using only tactile feedback. In details, the system is based on a linear motor that we will call the cart that displaces a gripper over um, a stator. And if we look at an explosion view of the gripper, this is actuated by a servo motor or dynamixel that uh, controls the distance between the two fingers that I keep with two of our tactile sensors. The sensor used here uh, is the one I showed you earlier in the talk with a slightly curved surface to recall a finger. Therefore, summarizing the system architecture, we have two control inputs, which are the cart acceleration and the gripping distance. Uh, and we have sensory feedback about the system, namely the card position and velocity that we can read from our actuators and the force distribution readings that we can predict with our sensor. Everything runs on embedded platform. A Raspberry Pi sends the commands to the actuators and also reads the card position and velocity from the linear motor. While an NVIDIA Jetson TX2 is employed to predict the force distribution with our sensor, as well as to run most of the control algorithms that I will describe in the following. So for this reason, the two devices communicate via internet, exchanging all the relevant information. The sensors employed here predict also the force distribution in a similar way as I explained earlier, with a data-driven model entirely trained with simulation data. So let me start focus more on the control problem. And here, the main difficulty is given by the fact that contact dynamics and soft materials are, in general, very hard to model analytically. And therefore, learning from data seems to be an appealing alternative to overcome this issue. However, learning on such a system is time consuming. And you also either need a, an automatic collector system or a very, very dedicated operator that all the time goes, picks up the pole, Bring it, brings it back to the original position after it flies away uh, during each uh, real world experiment. So for this reason, we shifted our focus towards obtaining policies and simulation using deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Now let's look at what we need from a simulator of this system. Well, first we would like it to be general purpose enough such that it could be extended to different use cases. Then we want um, the simulator to generate sensible sensor output the force distribution in our case, while retaining computational efficiency. Finally, a common technique to tackle the sim to real transfer consists in randomizing the simulation parameters to increase robustness of the control policies. Therefore, we want our simulations to our simulation to be modular enough such that we could alter these parameters during training. Now, all these requirements can be satisfied with a strategy that is based on the finite element method with the simplification that the materials are assumed to be linearly elastic. But how this does this simulation work? Well, first we simulate everything at the level of the forces. And this is made possible by the fact that our sensor already outputs force values. Therefore, we do not need to simulate the optics we facilitate the system modeling. The material model is also simplified, as I was mentioning, by relaxing the hyperelastic assumption and assuming that the materials are static linearly elastic. This is a quite, quite a strong assumption, but turned out to be enough to capture the trends of the force distributions in our simulations. Now, based on this, we developed the finite element direct stiffness approach, which we augmented with an iterative calculation of the friction forces. For this, we first mesh our sensing surface, dividing it in a series of finite elements. The method then works in two steps. 
First, first we uh, identify the force arising from frictionless normal indentations. And for this, we divide the nodes of the mesh in three sets. So this figure here shows the nodes as dots spread over the sensing surface in green. So we define the set C as the set of nodes in contact with the pole, this node here. Then we define the set F as the set of nodes in contact with the base of the centers. And then we define the set N as a set of the remaining nodes. And it turns out that we know something about each of these sets. For example, we know that the nodes in the set C stay attached to the pole. And if we assume them to just displace vertical, we know everything about their displacement. The nodes in the set F stay remain attached to the rigid base of the sensors. Therefore, they do not displace, while all the remaining nodes have no external force applied on them. Finally, we can use this information to apply direct stiffness, which is based on a stiffness matrix K that can be built offline in a finite element environment and is constant only for linearly elastic materials. This matrix relates the nodal displacement with the nodal forces. And for each node, we either know the displacement or the force. Therefore, the system of equations can be solved very efficiently to calculate the remaining unknowns. The forces F0 uh, that I defined here consider a frictionless contact. So the next step is to account for the presence of friction. We do this in an iterative way, that is by first assuming that the friction force is unknown only at one node that we call I. Then we uh, compute the friction force at the node I, assuming Coulomb friction. I will give you more detail in the following. Then we repeat this for all the nodes and then iterate until, until we uh, see no changes in the values that we obtain or until a fixed number of iterations. Finally, we sum the resulting friction forces, FF, with the forces resulting from the previous step where we assumed a frictionless vertical indentation. And the resulting forces, F, are used in our simulation to simulate the system by propagating them through the forward dynamics, where we use a semi-implicit integration scheme, such as in gaming engines or in simulators like Mujoko. But we also use the force uh, distribution F uh, to generate the synthetic sensing output as well, where we again discretize our sensing surface to obtain a discretized force distribution in a regular grid. Now I'll show you in detail what we actually do in these two steps to compute the friction force at one node in the current iteration using Coulomb friction. Obviously, we need to compute the friction force only at the nodes in contact with the pole. And first, we compute the relative velocity uh, at the node I with respect to the center of the sensor. This means that we subtract the velocity of the sensor from the velocity at the node, which we can compute using the velocity of the pole, its angular velocity, and the position of the node everything known in simulation. What we are actually interested in is the relative velocity at the next time step, because as I mentioned, we use a semi-implicit integration scheme and it is standard uh, to always employ the next step velocity to achieve better stability. We can express the next step velocity with this equation here uh, that is retrieved via the previous equation and the equations of motion that we use to simulate the system. Now going through each term, uh, this is uh, the relative velocity at the current time step. Uh, this is the, the acceleration of the sensor. These matrices JII and JIJ just contain um, the physical parameters of our system. And these here are the horizontal forces at the node I and the node J. These are, this is the node where we are currently trying to actually estimate the friction forces. Now in this equation, we have two unknown quantities, uh, the friction forces at node i and the uh, relative velocity at the next time step. However, if we assume static friction, we can set the sliding velocity to zero and compute the friction force by just solving the equation. However, we need to verify that the friction force respects the friction cone constraint where this value here was computed in the previous step where we assumed a vertical indentation. Now, if this uh, cone constraint is satisfied, then we are done with this node and we proceed to the next. But if this is violated, then we have to go back. And um, in this equation, we still have two uh, unknowns that we cannot decouple. 
We therefore use an approximation and neglect the contribution of this node to the overall sum. This approximation is generally not too bad because we use over 500 nodes and the overall contribution of this node to the total sum is usually not too large in average. Based on this, we uh, compute uh, the relative velocity at the next time step and then use Coulomb friction law to uh, compute the friction forces at the node I. Again, these forces are then summed to the respective forces stemming from the normal indentation and computed in the first step of the procedure. In this way, we obtain the three-dimensional contact force distribution, which is the same quantity estimated in the real world with our tactile sensor. You can see the results here with a comparison between the forces predicted in the real world on the left versus the simulated sensor output on the right. The simulation is very efficient and runs at 360 Hertz on a single core of a standard CPU, which means six times faster than our real time. We can then use such an efficient simulator to tackle the problem in simulation using deep reinforcement learning. And as a requirement, we would like to swing a pulse for which the physical parameters are unknown to the policies. However, this breaks the Markov property assumption because we are uh, introducing additional unknowns in the system dynamics. Additionally, state information is incomplete on the real system or only indirectly available. In fact, we don't directly measure the pose of the pole, but we can only observe it through the force distribution measurements. For this reason, we take a privileged learning approach where we first exploit the full knowledge of the system that we have in simulation. For this reason, we define an augmented state, X prime of K, that is the concatenation of the system state with the pole's physical parameters. Then an expert policy is trained using an off-the-shelf reinforcement learning algorithm with the pole's physical parameters randomized at each new episode during training. In this way, the neural network that parameterizes the policies chooses different actions based on the features of the pole. The policy, the policy is optimized by maximizing an expected reward, which depends on the privileged information about the augmented state that we have in simulation, and aims to swing up the pole up to a vertical position while maintaining low slippage. You can see here the results of the training with the expert policy able to consistently swing up poles that differ in mass, diameter, and uh, length. Finally, we develop a student policy which is trained as well in simulation to learn to imitate the expert. And we exploit the fact that the pulse pose and parameters can be indirectly observed through the force distribution measurements. However, since the Markov property is not holding, we need the policy to consider uh, multiple force distribution measurements over time. And therefore, we construct an history of uh, T observation, OT, where these quantities O, the, uh, the last um, related to the last T time steps, are the concatenations of these four quantities, that is the card position and the gripping distance that we can obtain from our actuators, the polar orientation that can be estimated from the force distribution measurements, and the total normal force, which can also be computed through the force distribution. Finally, the policy is uh, optimized by minimizing a stochastic loss where the labels are obtained by curing the expert policy for the visited states. So to summarize again, all the training happens in simulation. An expert policy uh, exploits privileged information from the simulation to train our enforcement learning uh, agent that predicts the optimal action to achieve the task. Then a student policy is learned in simulation to imitate the expert by simply observing an history of measurements, namely the actuator states and the force distribution without direct knowledge of the physical parameters of the pole. Now, these measurements are all available in the real world, and that is why we use the student policy directly on the real system. We directly deploy it in the policy without further adaptation, and the, its robustness makes it possible to swing up poles of different length, diameter, and mass with a pure feedback policy without the use of any feedforward term. Let me stress the fact that the feedback is indeed crucial to solve this task. In fact, 
actions depend on the physical parameters of the pose that are unknown to the real world policy beforehand. And the same actions also depend on the initial configuration of the poll that of course differs across trials, even if minimally. And even if these two sources of uncertainty would, uh, would, to be eliminated, would be eliminated, then we will still, it would still be hard to achieve such an accurate set point tracking as the one shown in these plots for repeated trials. Now, looking also at some failure cases, this table shows experiments with four different poles where we aim to perform 10 successful swing ups with each of the poles. You can see that for the successful tests, we had comparable final errors, all in the order of five degrees. Pole two, the longest, was even slightly outside of the training distribution range. However, we noticed a higher failure rate with pole one, and I've tried to give you some intuition about the typical failure case. Essentially, our simulation underestimates an effect that we observe in the real world. What happens is that when clamping, our material shows a, a relatively strong spring effect that makes the pole bounce back from the vertical position. Then the cart tries to correct this misalignment by providing the right acceleration here between 0.5 and 1. However, for short poles, like pole one, we need aggressive accelerations to achieve the desired torques. And in some cases, this makes a system um, motion to become too jerky and we lose grip of the pole. So this approach is relatively successful with the swing up, but can it work for different tasks? Well, it turns out that by tweaking the reward in simulation, it is possible to achieve different motions, such as a pro and catch maneuver. Of course, replicating this motion on the real system requires addressing other issues as the non-planar motion of the pole during the flight phase, but the simulator could be, it could be easily extended to account for these effects as well, and uh, we are currently working on it. So let me draw an outlook to mention where I think we are and where we are heading with this work in the direction of Dexter's manipulation. First, this system, which is only a proof of concept, achieves a rotational motion of the pole without directly controlling a rotational degree of freedom of the system. Therefore, this motion is only made possible through the presence of friction. And for this task, as for many others, modeling friction is crucial to design realistic simulators, and this will remain a very relevant aspect in addressing manipulation tasks. The simulation approach I presented only used the fact that the pole is cylindrical when dividing the nose into three different sets, uh, as I showed you earlier. But the approach can be extended to various geometries by the use of efficient algorithms that solve the intersection uh, between polygons. Finally, we knew that for this task, angular and total force information were key to perform the swing up. And therefore we use those as part of the history of observations. However, for different tasks, it could be beneficial to design algorithms, for example, based on autoencoders, that could automatically discover the meaningful intermediate representations from the force distribution readings to further improve the generalizability of the approach. I will conclude remarking the main messages of this talk. First, high resolution tactile sensing can largely benefit from physical intermediate representation, which can be used as an abstraction to plan generic robotic tasks. We demonstrated this on our tactile control testbed, where we showed the potential of tactile sensing to achieve dynamic manipulation tasks. We wanted to show that tactile sensing can enable tasks that are very challenging for humans to perform without vision, but in the future, it will be important to also include vision in the loop to improve the efficiency and performance in a sensor fusion fashion. Finally, for both the points above, uh, I believe that Accurate simulations were and would be crucial to learn high dimensional policies on robots that can make use of high resolution modern tactile sensors. With this, let me thank my advisor, Professor Rafael Andrea, and all the students that I've supervised here at TTH and that have enormously contributed to the work that I have presented. Thank you for listening, and I will be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo, for the great talk. Uh, the stage is open for questions. If you have one, simply unmute yourself and ask one. Yes, I would directly start with uh, two questions I have actually. Go ahead. Uh, Carlo, very cool talk. Uh, nice to see what you did over the last years. Um, and also looking forward to like the, the, the flying poles, yeah. hopefully in the near future. Me too. Um, 
So the first question is, I mean, of course, like um, your sensor is still like a prototype stage um, and it's like, like a little bit large. Um, where do you see the limit of making this like, like really on a small scale in the sense that maybe like only be as, as large as a fingertip, for example? Yeah. I'll maybe show you, uh, I have a video here. Um, let me go through it. Uh, I, I just run it while I answer you. Um, this is essentially a work we, we made just again as a proof of concept, to essentially to tackle what you were saying, how, how thin we can go. And here, the, the, the requirement was make the sensor as thin as possible and uh, uh, make it, uh, wait, I, think I need to run this first. Uh, let me see, it's worked. Ah, here, yeah, I think now it's running. Yes, so we wanted to make the sensor as thin as possible and also cover a larger surface. And we wanted to only use uh, things easily available on the market. So comp components are easily available on the market. So we used Raspberry Pi cameras, which are quite thin. We used four of them um, and then applied essentially the same principle. We obtained a, a thickness of 1.7 centimeters, which is more or less as a fingertip, just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, there are cameras on the market that can make this even thinner. And these cameras are designed for other purposes to take pictures, essentially, right? Uh, and uh, the, the thing is that if we set some requirements to, for, for producers to, to make cameras, to produce cameras that are set designed for tactile sensing, where we need like a very close um, field of focus, for example, a, a large field of view and so on, um, then I think we could even shrink this, uh, this uh, thickness even more. But it's definitely doable. If you think of endoscope cameras, um, the technology is there. It just needs to be used uh, for this application as well. Mm. Okay, cool. Thanks. And the other question I would have is, so in your DeepRL framework, you use this uh, expert student uh, architecture. Yeah. What was the reason why you didn't like immediately go from like the simulated forces, um, like these images to 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 the, the policy directly? Yeah, maybe let me go back to the plot here. Yeah, this thing here. So yeah. essentially, the reason is that we don't know, like the, the in, in the real world, we don't know the uh, physical parameters of the pole. So we assume the pole to be just unknown, just put a pole, and the, the system has to estimate on the go the, um, uh, I don't know, the mass, the length, and the diameter of the pole. So now you could say like, oh, why don't you have a, a policy that is just robust enough to different poles? Uh, the thing is that, for, for example, for poles with different diameters, this is even like, it's very easy to, under, to, to, to get, right? It's if you have a pen, which is like one centimeter, one that is two centimeters, the pole will be completely different. The actions will be completely different. Therefore, we need a way really to estimate on the go the, uh, yeah, the, these parameters uh, during, the, during a run. And for this reason, like in the, in the simulation, we, we do everything where we know uh, like the simulation parameters, like the poles parameters and so on, which makes the policy very robust to, to all of these different different poles, provided that the parameters are known, and then the student policy just learns some kind of interpolation. It's a bit more of an interpolation, but it kind of tries to learn between the different poles, like what actions to to act to actually plan uh, during the during each run. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Any other question? Actually, I have one. So the first Lucas had uh, was also a question I had. So I, I was more, can you make it? Uh, and connected to this, I imagine that at some point you want to make, so I, I saw you, you had the grid of four of them. Uh, now I imagine having even more and having some uh, uh, triggering that triggers more cameras, right? So have you thought about, cost, uh, about uh, having uh, joint observations of different uh, parts of a surface that are triggered by a single movement, and how how do does it scale with the number of sensors you yeah. use or the number of? Yeah, uh, so we've done different uh, a little bit of scalability uh, work. I, I, I'm gonna tell you in a second, but first to answer your question, it would be very interesting, like to have, uh, um, you know, if you scale this up to a, an entire skin. I don't know if having something centralized is the right way to go. Uh, you would need something responsive, as you said, like, I don't know, we, I can imagine like our, our balancing system works, right? If I get pushed in my hand, 
uh, my hand can react uh, to the push. I don't need to use the entire body. Then, of course, if the if the push is bigger, then I, I kind of start using the other muscles to to counteract this uh, this action. Um, something similar could be done with sensing, right? You could have um, uh, very localized uh, stimuli that are only um, you know, you, you feel you only felt at the localized point and sent to the central system or even tackle distributely. Uh, of course, larger interactions than we need, like, of course, there is no way to, to, to kind of scale down a larger interaction, for example, with an entire chest. We have done some work instead in uh, answering the question of uh, how much data do you need to, to kind of generalize the force uh, uh, measurements over all the body. And the way we did it is by in this uh, in the sensor with four cameras, we only trained the sensor with data from three cameras and then performed like kind of a retraining procedure uh, only with fourth camera. And there we could uh, scale down the data requirements by 75%. So really confirming that the relevant features are extracted by the architecture, then just a matter of placing them well, depending on the geometry. Nice, um, thank you. You. Any other question? I have one, but I, I don't want to steal people's time. Okay, seems I can go. Um, the, uh, the other question I have is, as you know, there are other people at ETH doing sensing kind of similar ideas, but using uh, electromagnetic techniques oh, or, yes. Yes. or these kind of things. Uh, of course, yours is, is nicer. You are from IDC and everything. But, <laughs> uh, uh, What's the selling point for your approach? I mean, the question is more, uh, what kind of applications does your approach unlock versus what they can actually do? Yeah, so one benefit of these vision-based sensors uh, is the fact that they have incredibly high resolution. Uh, so we get a million of pixels with just one reading at each time step, then I, the matter is like, uh, do we need all of this resolution? Uh, maybe not so much, but we definitely need uh, distributed measurements, in my opinion. Uh, I think total forces are not enough for different applications. You've seen the application of the um, of the swing up. You would need something to, to give you the angle, right? So if you can do, we can do it with one sensor only and without sensorizing the pole. Uh, with other sensors that only estimate the total forces, you would have no idea of the angle, for example. Uh, another advantage, which... Uh, in, on an engineering perspective, I think it's very important is the fact that uh, we only get one wire out of our sensor. And that is, goes to a USB plug and uh, um, it's very easy to use. Um, while usually for, I don't know, I'm thinking not only about magnetical uh, sensors, but also sensors based on capacitance changes and so on, like touch screens and so on, you need a lot of values to probe from your surface. And uh, all these cables in a robotic setting where there is a lot of motion, uh, it's probably not ideal. That's a very practical consideration. Then there is another consideration, which I think even more practical. And it, it is the fact that in robotics labs, there is already knowledge about computer vision. Uh, while maybe there is not knowledge about other stuff. Uh, and uh, this principle is perfect for rapid prototyping. I don't know if this will be the winning principle in the future, but for sure it will help a lot advancing the field because um, People can just in, learn how to cast silicon, which is very, very easy. I mean, people do it as an hobby. And uh, uh, then that's it. You just plug in a camera. You already have the knowledge. You have the drivers of the cameras. You have the software to process the images, and you can do a lot of stuff. So I think that's one of the reasons why the field is progressing so much is the, the development of this kind of sensors that exploit knowledge already present in the lab. That's a very good selling point. Thank you. <laughs> um... Thank you. Any other question? Okay, doesn't seem so. Uh, thank you very much, Carlo. Thank um, you. I'm very happy to have seen what you have done in the past years. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, you can reach out to Carlo. I'm sure he's happy to discuss uh, more in detail. Thank you very much again for the talk. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for for being here. See you next week for the next Autonomy Talk. See you. Bye.